welcome to another edition of the eSpot with Camille. The eSpot is your location for the latest in entertainment, beauty, and design from the people who make it. Thanks for joining. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to season seven of the East Spot with Camille. And I am super excited for me to bring back from the purple carpet to now the Be Life carpet. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> The East Spot Carpet. I have the Dr. Casey Allen Collins joining us because we're paging Dr. Nurse Casey. I don't know if I said her name in the right order, Dr. Casey Ann Collins. Yes. But either way, I am so glad to have you back. Thank you so much for joining me here again because we're about to get into a serious discussion about women's health and dermatology. You guys know I was an esthetician spa director, so skin is always into me. So I always want to talk about it and get the chance, especially with someone so beautiful. I pro tip before you go to someone check their Facebook page you know play it by ear play it by ear so again Dr. Casey Ann Collins share a little bit about your history because or about your journey to becoming a nurse doctor because we're all excited to hear from you and get some great tips on how we can better take care of ourselves yes hi thank you so much for having me um it's so funny I think women's health chose me because I started off in dermatology so when I first became a nurse um, I had my associates. I worked for a dermatology practice, a private practice, which I love. I fell in love with derm immediately. Um, the doctor that I was working with was like, you're absolutely amazing. I need you to do more. Are you going to go back to school? And I planned to become a nurse practitioner, but it was a little bit later on. Um, they hired a nurse practitioner who's my mentor. Um, shout out to Lynette. Um, she walked in. She was this perfectly classy dressed lady. I was like, who is that? Um, so I kind of trained her on like some billing, but she already knew her derm stuff. She was like, you know, like a household name in dermatology. And she kind of took me under her wing and she told me, she was like, go back to nurse practitioner school. You're great. You know everything. So I went back to NP school, graduated. Um, the actual practice, um, the whole situation about me working there didn't actually work out, but I still carried derm with me, um, which was great because I ended up in women's health. And like I said, women's health chose me. Um, and I've actually been in women's health four years today. Um, yesterday was my work anniversary. Um, and it's amazing because a lot of derm crosses over into women's health, right? It's a holistic approach, at least for nurse practitioners, mind, body, soul, one system affects another system. If you're stressed out, you can get acne, you can throw off your cycle, your menstrual cycle. So they're very uh, related, uh, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. So that's how I ended up in women's health. And I, you know, I love Derm, you know, I still do cosmetics on the side, but I let the, you know, both worlds collide. Yeah, no, let's talk about a little bit about that. Because I feel like people act like acne stops as soon as you hit teenage years. I'm here to tell you that is a complete bold faced lie. I didn't even have acne issues as a teenager, but I do now. So can you share a little bit about for each decade, what are the main concerns that they should make if they're having these certain issues that it's time to see a doctor for. That is not just something they can get over the counter or some. Um, I know my back in my day, it was wearing Noxzema for like extra, <laughs> like wear it as a mask instead of just cleansing to help get rid of acne. And I remember reading about putting toothpaste on pimples. Like there were so many different wrong <laughs> um, things that we were taught to do. But can you share a little bit more from a professional's perspective, not just WebMD and Google and some of the TikTokers too out there, no offense, some are doing great and some are doing the devil's work. So can you share a little bit about what, when to go seek professional help? Absolutely. Um, I would say what I see in my practice around the teenager age, yes, you can have a different type of hormonal acne. Um, some of that is related to PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where there's a hormonal imbalance. Um, and that can cause acne on the lower portion of the face, which we know can be related to hormones. Um, few days later, you can still get adult acne. I've even struggled with that. I remember in grad school where you're still getting that cystic type of acne. You're like, I'm a grown woman. What's happening? What's going on? And I usually implore females to check their hormones because even though you may not have had, um, you know, acne in your teens, you can definitely have it as an adult due to a hormonal change. And there are various medications, uh, lifestyle changes, as well as topicals that you can use and also see your amazing estheticians and dermatological specialists because they know skin 
you know, better than most experts. So, um, you know, um, they are experts. So I would definitely recommend that. But the hormones never lie. And it's important to figure out what's going on internally before you concentrate just on the exterior. Yeah. And that I, so many times when I see some of these TikTokers or influencers, they have really bad skin and they're just taking on more makeup, more makeup, more makeup. And it's just like, oh, you wouldn't need all that makeup if you just took better care of your skin. I mean, I know they're trying to promote products, but skincare is products too. And if you show the transition from before and after, it's so inspiring. Like that was one of my favorite clients to deal with is were acne patients because there was such a huge transition. They would have such greater confidence and they would want to wear less makeup. I mean, you got to concentrate more on the fun stuff, you know, (laughs) eye makeup and lip color and cheek color, as opposed to always trying to find ways to kind of camouflage what's going on. But now I'm reaching that other age, which some of my audience is too, where we're not quite menopause, but we're perimenopausal. And there's a lot of hormonal changes and a lot of oh, it's just stress. Oh, just drink more water. Oh, go see a therapist. But sometimes it's 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 something going on inside of your body, whether it's with oh, um, fibroids or um, endometriosis, or like you mentioned, PCOS with having to get even laser hair removal if you're having extensive hair growth. Can you share a little bit about once you're past those fun acne years of teenage years, but you come back to these new hormonal years, like your 30s and so on, that also causes new changes with your skin, as well as your um, internal women organs <laughs> that could be causing yeah. some of that. Absolutely. That pre perimenopausal phase can be a little bit tricky, right? Because you're still getting your cycle, but it may be irregular. It comes one month, one month it doesn't. Um, you just feel different. Metabolism changes. Again, I would implore my patients or any female to just go ahead and check your hormones. So you can check your estrogen level. That can play a huge role. Your thyroid, um, your luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. Number one, so we can rule out if you are actually in perimenopause. And we can also do an ultrasound to look at the uterus to see if there's something else going on. Uh, adenomyosis, which is uh, benign blood clots in the lining of the uterus. Fibroids, as you mentioned. Um, maybe a little PCOS out of nowhere. You may not have had it your whole life. And you know, if you, you put a couple pounds on or if you're stressed or for whatever rhyme or reason, you might have developed PCOS. So it's super important to get that evaluation. But again, the hormones are pretty concrete and it could be due to stressful events and obviously environmental changes, but the hormones should always be assessed first. Yeah. And when, um, when it comes to like hormonal changes and the different things, like there's also the a lot of taboos or people telling you certain things like, oh, you're going to have night sweats. Oh, you better use it before you lose it. Talking about our um, Pikachu. Um, can you share a little bit of, well, I shouldn't say Pikachu. I'm a grown ass woman. Um, our vagina, our uterus, <laughs> our right. labial That's folds. Right. <laughs> what is going to change? What do, Can we still have sex in our 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s? Oh my. Can you share a little bit how we can preserve that part of our body too? Because... We're hearing a lot of things like I've heard things from, oh, it feels like getting glass broken once you get a certain age or the dryness is an issue. So let's get into it. I'm sure there's right now a bunch of people just change the channel. So bye. But for those that still <laughs> stuck around, what can we look forward to and how can we preserve our little sister as well? <laughs> That's right. I think every female is different, right? So one female will go through menopause and may experience hot flashes, night sweats, even mood changes, and another female may not. So the hormones play a role, how you take care of yourself, your lifestyle, were you always athletic, you were eating right, you were taking care of yourself. Um, Some females experience vaginal dryness, some do not. And just to explain that decline in the estrogen is usually what kind of prompts that vaginal dryness or the changes in the labial fold, sometimes a bit of atrophy or actually shrinking in the collagen of that area. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's non-hormonal treatments and hormonal treatments. Hormonal treatments would be more so if you're already in menopause, there is that official decline in the estrogen. We can give you various creams, suppositories, um, you name it, right? Um, And you don't lose it per se. There can be a decline in your libido, absolutely. Um, But there's things that we can do, whether, again, it's the topical treatments, hormonal, non-hormonal, depending on if there's no contraindications. Sex therapy, sex therapy is really good. Also making sure there's nothing going on psychologically and emotionally. Because usually when I sit down with my patients, there is a physical aspect, but then there's also something going on. You know, my husband isn't as uh, home as he used to be. We're stressed out. You know, the, the spice has kind of left the relationship. 
So you can bat all those things together, then yeah, you know, they may not be much of a, a, a steamy uh, mm -hmm. sex life. So it's super important. I think it's important to talk about this because I love to empower women. And you're right. It, it seems like it's a taboo and we kind of hush hush it. And I'm mm -hmm. like, no, if you feel like my your sex drive is not what it needs to be, let's check the hormones. Let's get you treatment. Uh, there's so many things on the market. Um, but again, first addressing what the issue is, is key. Because uh, sex is healthy. It's in numerous studies. It releases endorphins. It makes you feel younger. You feel more vibrant. It's good for your skin. It is necessary and a good part of health. So I think people forget about that part of health. Sexual yeah. health is super important. Yeah, because we're, we're women now. We have control of our bodies. And that means that we should enjoy all of our bodies from head to toe. And of Correct. course, media. <laughs> so when you were talking about the different things, I know back in the day, I had heard of, and I have not heard of it recently, and maybe it's just because of the different things going on in the purple pill or blue pill. I don't know what color it is, but there's something like that for women as well. Is that something that you suggest that we look out for? Is there something we can even use over the counter that would be something for women who are starting to lose their libido? Or no? Absolutely. There's something on the market. Um, basically, it's a pill, and it would be equivalent, I guess, to the male version of Viagra. Um, it definitely helps to stimulate your libido or you feel more like yourself. Um, and it is approved for females that are in menopause. Again, due to that decline in the estrogen, we want to bring that level back up, get you feeling like yourself again. And this is what we want because sex is healthy. So definitely it's out there. As far as uh, over the counter, uh, most of the most of the actual treatments are non-hormonal. So they don't actually have a high level of hormone. You would have to get that via prescription. Okay. Now, when you say prescription, does that mean it's also covered by insurance? Because I know allegedly the blue for the dudes are. So can we get our groove on too? Yes, it is. Amazing news. It is covered. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Something to look forward to. <laughs> that Uncle Sam will cover us as well. So exactly. um, like, I, I want to cover this and I want to be considerate of like um, the age group as well. But when you get to the 60s or 70s, I remember reading these different um, articles about certain senior sitters popping off because the adults were just having brand new fun with all their new neighbors and STDs were an issue or STIs, I guess they call it now, um, showing my age. But can you share a little bit even about protecting that area now? Because I think there hasn't been as much even for my daughter, like in her um, sex edge class, I don't feel like they're talking as much about protection. I mean, we're also like teaching abstinence, but at the same time, let's be realistic. How do we keep these women safe and protected when they're out there? Yeah, absolutely. I would say as we go through the change of life, absolutely, we should still use protection. Yes, you're correct. There was a study that did show there was a high percentage of STIs in nursing homes. They're having lots of intercourse, which is great. But, you know, I, I guess healthy assumed, and young. Yes, I guess it was assumed that that age that they may not need protection. You still need to protect yourself. Um, you know, about 80 percent of people may have STIs and may not even know everyone presents differently as far as signs and symptoms. So that's something I usually stress. Um, and in my younger, uh, you know, female, same thing. When we're talking about birth control, I try to stress that birth control is great to prevent pregnancy, but it does not prevent STI. So people kind of assume your own birth control is going to prevent that. It's just strictly to prevent pregnancy and, you know, whatever else we're treating, heavy periods, painful periods, things like that. But definitely uh, wrap it up is still a thing from, um, you know, young to, you know, elderly, absolutely. Yeah, what was the saying? No love without a raincoat, something like that. I remember. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no love, no love without no a raincoat love. or glove yeah, or something like that. Right. Yeah, <laughs> still exactly. true, and um, still true no matter if your partner is same sex or not, right? So, um, be protection, use protection. Now, um, speaking of taboos in women's health, I want to also talk about, I guess, because there's been a lot of um, surveys and studies how there's that discrepancy between black women's health and, and I guess people who aren't black women. What do you think is the biggest reason besides that, besides having access to medical care? Cause that has become something nuanced in our community where we don't trust the doctors. We saw that big with COVID where people didn't want to do the different vaccines or, and I'm not judging, but I'm just saying there was that, um, 
understanding, like I could understand it because of Tuskegee Airmen, because of um, Harry, Henrietta Flat, Flat uh, I'm sorry if I'm butchering her name, Henrietta. Henrietta. Yeah. Yes. Um, like we've been through experiences where we couldn't necessarily trust the medical professional. So you being a doctor, you being on the fighting lines with us, what are some of the signs, I guess, that we should look for when we're choosing a doctor to make sure they are listening to us and do notice those discrepancies that are higher in black communities like fibroids and so on that we should make sure they're testing us for or that we can be advocates for. Never be afraid to seek a second opinion. So if you get a diagnosis and it doesn't see, sit right with you, go out there, get a second opinion. That's your prerogative. That is your right as a patient. And you want to make sure that you advocate for yourself. Uh, another tip I usually tell my patients, come in with a list of questions so you can make sure you get them answered because you never leave the doctor or any appointment. You're like, I forgot to ask that. So I think that's super important. But find someone that you feel comfortable with. And if you don't feel comfortable with that person, again, it's your right to make sure you do find someone that you actually can have some type of camaraderie with. Now, I'm so glad you brought that up because um, I recently had to have, uh, well, I guess it's been two years now, but I had to have a hysterectomy and found out after the fact that I had endometriosis as well. And she never explained to me what it was and never explained like what was going on with me. And then um, I, before like a couple of days I was home, I ended up having a pulmonary embolism as well and had to go back to the hospital. And I told them that deep vein thrombosis had run in my family and different things. Right. So I had no idea to even advocate for like, hey, I might need blood thinners or so on. Right. But those are certain things like I think that a lot of times until you go through it, you don't know. And I'm glad that you're saying how important it is that if you ask questions and they don't answer them, that it's a good time to find someone else that will because it doesn't necessarily matter if they're the best in their business, if they can't explain exactly. it to you. But at the same time, I want the best search. <laughs> and if exactly. you have the worst side manner, but you're the best at your job, I'm willing to do that. But please exactly. have a nurse that's willing to answer all the questions or it's something. It's true. It can be you a know? matter of life and death. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And someone's, mm -hmm. you feel someone's always rushing you out of the office and they forgot yeah. to tell you that your pap smear shows high risk cervical cancer. You know, it can be a matter of life and death. So it's super important. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just grateful that you brought that up as well. And now is there any like code words we could use to say, Hey, we, we know what we're asking. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> like, oh, wait, let me make sure I'm doing everything right. She knows the, she knows the CDC guy or something. Just yeah, nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I go to a certain hospital because I volunteer there so much. And like, um, the, the leader there, or the head of the hospital there, he's met me and I've met him a few times. So I feel like if, yeah. if things ever felt like uncomfortable, I could send him a letter, but hey, by the way, who do you suggest or something? But that was yeah. my plan the whole time because my yeah. mom had gone through cancer at a different hospital and like there were all the red flags constantly going up and we just, she was too scared to transfer because they had started her care there. She was going through cancer because of her uh, medical that she had at the time because she'd been healthy her whole life. She was a stunt woman. She was active, karate, like all of that or Shotokan. So um, she had like the lowest deductible or something like that. Like, you know, it was before Obamacare and she only had like six months to get all of her treatment. Otherwise she had to restart all over with her $5,000 deductible. And I think that's very common for a lot of people. And I think it's even going to be more common with all these strikes that are going on, especially in my industry where they're not going to be able to meet their women's health or meet their health care. Yeah. And we'll have to figure out ways to get everything done within a certain time. Cause this year's is coming to a close. <laughs> so as I hate to see summer's almost ending, but it, facts are facts. So, um, are there certain things, certain tests that every year you shouldn't skip on? Like I know at 45 or even at 40, they're saying um, now they're saying they're pushing back mammograms. They're pushing back when you should get your um, colonoscopies and different things. But are there certain things that you're like, you definitely have to get these done no matter what your finances may be? Like try to make sure you get these testing on a regular basis to make sure you don't end up with something worse later on. Yeah. Absolutely. At least in my uh, specialty, uh, getting your pap smears, I can't stress that enough. It's super, super important. Um, you know, once you are sexually active, uh, the guidelines recommend age 21 and above. But if you become sexually active prior, we may even do a pap smear a little bit earlier, especially if there is a family history of any breast or gynecological cancers. So we want to screen for that because sometimes you can have HPV and that can come and go. Don't get me wrong, but it depends on, uh, you know, what strain of HPV, what variant is it? high risk is it 
low risk. Um, so that's super important, especially in the U.S. So we save the screen once a year. I know in the U.K., I believe they do it every three years. Breast exam. Can't stress that enough. I lost a grandmother to uh, breast cancer, unfortunately. So, so, so important, whether you're active or not, to actually screen, check your breast, do self-breast examination. Something feels different. They feel heavier, more painful. There's changes in the actual skin on the nipple or the actual breast. There's lumps underneath the armpit. Super, super important. Even if we don't do a mammogram, we can do a breast ultrasound to assess. And to um, piggyback on your question with mammograms, definitely around age 38, 40, but again, if you have a first degree family member that was diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of 50, then we can screen at least five years prior to their age of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if they were diagnosed at you know, 40, would probably screen you at 35 just to get a baseline mammogram and ultrasound of the breast, which is super important. No, I'm glad you brought that up because I had, um, I have dense breast tissue. And so that's one of the things when I do self exams, it's more like, oh my God, this all feels like, especially if I drank a lot of caffeine lately, I'm like, oh. And I don't know right. how true that is, but I, I feel it's mentally, yeah. <laughs> the more caffeine I have in my system, the bigger the lumps get sometimes. And I'm always like, because I do have breast cancer um, history, I'm always like, okay, but there's nothing in the armpits. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the more caffeine I have in my system, the bigger the lumps get sometimes. And I'm always like, because I do have breast cancer um, history, I'm always like, okay, but there's nothing in the armpits. I'm safe. Like, you know, like nothing is because it's hard to remember which which lumps were there before and after type of thing, especially since they get larger or smaller. But now I'm like, I can't believe how much I'm touching myself on camera, but hey, <laughs> covered everything that is the most urgent you feel like from your perspective. So if there's anything else that you would like to share to make sure that women are aware of, please use this time to share that as well. Anything, anything out of the ordinary, at the end of the day, you know your body, right? You're going in to see a clinician. They're just there to kind of do a workup and make sure there's nothing going on. Um, but if you feel like there's a change, don't be afraid to make an appointment just to check whether that changes in the breast. Um, if you're having bleeding during intercourse, that could be a sign of something going on with the cervix or some type of cyst. You can always do an ultrasound to rule out cysts, fibroids, polyps, and et cetera. Um, we also mentioned um, this with the changes in the hormones, go on and get a blood test. That's simple. That's a quick blood test to check the hormones, make sure there's nothing going on. Your thyroid, which is super important, that's something that we can always check. Um, libido, again, we talked about being a taboo. I think going in and saying, hey, you know, I just don't feel like myself. You know, there's a lack of interest in my sexual activity. I want to know what's going on. And we can check the hormones, the sex therapy, which I think is highly underused, but so good, where you can really sit down and kind of get back into the swing of things. And again, just making sure you know your body, you advocate for yourself, super, super important. Okay, great. Um, one little thing I just want to piggyback on that, because recently I worked with a lady who was um, adamant about being anti pelvic floor therapy. And I went through pelvic floor therapy and it changed my life. And so I want to make sure people understand the difference between sex therapy and pelvic floor therapy, because that was yeah. her thoughts of like, I don't want to pay somebody to t touch me, you know, well, I don't right. want to go into all the details, just in case you can Google what pelvic floor therapy is. But at the right. same time, from your experience, can you share a little bit about why that's so different and how they um they can work together, but they're not the same thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Sex therapy, we're more focusing on obviously libido, issues that can be a barrier to sexual health, to pleasure during intercourse. Uh, well, pelvic floor, we're working on strengthening that pelvic floor, right? Because, you know, having children can sometimes weaken the pelvic floor. We have sometimes marathon runners, uh, bodybuilders, because there's that straining. If you suffer from constipation, you're in a constant state of straining that can weaken mm. your pelvic floor muscle. So it's super important to kind of help build that even for uh, what we call stress or uh, urinary incontinence where you laugh you sneeze you get a little bit of leakage which is super common amongst all age groups um, it's important to actually go and have that evaluated that can help I mean that's more of the bladder but that can still help as far as just tightening strengthening that muscle which is super important and for overall health as well so I agree that is two different things but some providers will use it um, together as a, as a collaboration now yeah, and the funny thing is with for me I didn't even realize I needed it because they were, I had, um, I had IBS type symptoms and I'd had a C-section. So I was like, oh, every, you know, like I was like, nothing's wrong down there. I had a C-section, but yeah. little do you know that because of the C-section, well, at least for, I guess, patients maybe that aren't, have a medical background that 
that scar tissue from having um, a C-section, like if you're not, because tr- they don't talk to you about scare, um, scar prevention and right. scar care or like even how to prevent certain things that happen afterwards. So definitely check into that because I feel like the binder, they just kind of handed it to you to wear, but you didn't really understand like, oh, I need to keep doing um, pelvic floor exercises or might need to go to a pelvic floor expert because of um, having a C-section. You kind of feel like, oh, that was the easy quote unquote easy, but it's not easy. <laughs> like, you're still having abdominal surgery. And even after having a C-section or having a hysterectomy, I had the same um, incision for that as well, that you do need to go back to make sure everything is working properly. And right. you don't have those issues because I never had the sneezing problem or the jumping problem. But then after I had my hysterectomy, everybody was like, oh yeah, I had to have that done because of fibroids. Oh yeah, I had to have I'm like, wait, why do you guys tell me this? Yeah, <laughs> I would exactly. have this a lot sooner, like to have my life back and no longer be jail. I'm not jail, job um, bait when I go or shark bait when I go to the um, beach. That alone has made my life different. So yeah. again, thank you so much for being a guest today. I want to make sure everybody knows that they can find you on IG at paging Dr. Casey TV. So again, paging Dr. Casey TV. But is there any other way that you would like for them to, um, if they needed to reach out to you and also share where you, um, the area you practice in case they want to come directly to you yeah, as well? I'm accepting new patients. Um, I'm in New York. I'm based in the Long Island area. Um, I work at Garden OBGYN. There are several locations. So if you are looking to book an appointment, they'll just let you know what location I am at that day or that week. Um, so yeah, I would love to see you guys, uh, Paige and Dr. Casey TV on Instagram, or you can email me, Dr. Casey Ann Collins at gmail.com. So hope to hear from you guys. That's wonderful. Thank you again for being my guest today. And thank you everyone out there for tuning in and for supporting the eSpot on another season. I really appreciate all of you and I appreciate your help. Please make sure you share, 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 let everyone know where they can go to learn more about entertainment today, women's health, (laughs) design, and beauty. Bye.